Hello everyone, this is your moderately humble host, The Board Observer, or Board Observer. Uh, no need for THE every time. Anywho, today I'm going to continue to introduce you to the various members of the intellectual dark web. One more thing before we begin with our next member. I keep saying that these videos will get shorter and shorter. You liar! I think that's an unrealistic expectation. There are some members whose stories are so complex and dense that a six minute video won't do them justice. Tick tock, mother Regardless, I think a more realistic expectation is that these videos are more information heavy, so it's not something you can watch in the background or view quickly on your phone in a public setting. This group of people, whether they realize it or not, are leading people from various political and philosophical backgrounds into rediscovering the ideas of the Enlightenment. Some are even giving, quote, non-believers to look again at religion. Nothing like this is happening at the level of the mainstream media or the mainstream narrative. While people at the surface continue to rip each other apart, ideas are being formed and political spectrums are shifting under the surface. Anywho, let's get this video going. The next member of the intellectual dark web is Professor Jonathan Haidt. Now to warn you, the pictures I show of him are going to vary in his appearance. This man apparently gets more gray hair by the month, so just be aware of that. Jonathan Haidt is a social psychologist and professor of ethical leadership at New York University Stern Business School. His main area of focus is the concept of morality vis-a-vis -vis social institutionism, moral disgust, moral elevation, and moral foundations theory. Being an academic, Haidt has noticed for some time that the culture of academia is becoming a monoculture and that when it becomes an echo chamber for one ideology, the university is in danger of dying and research will die along with it. He states that until the mid-90s, the left to right ratio at universities was two to one. Then, 15 years later, the ratio changes from two to one to five to one, and these ratios account for all departments and universities. Narrowing down further, he looked at his field, psychology, for the divide between left and right. In the 60s, psychologists voted for Kennedy four to one. He states that that's not too alarming because psychologists tend to lean left. This four to one divide was holding steady until the mid 1990s. However, recently, the ratio for the left right divide has now reached 17 to one. I wager a guess at this moment, you probably aren't surprised. Colleges are liberal. It's a fact. There's nothing wrong with it. Height says you're dead wrong. In contemporary academia, Height says there is a battle of two views of what a university should be and how it should operate. So first, uh, John Stuart Mill. Uh, he who knows only his own side of the case knows little of that. His reasons may be good, and no one may have been able to refute them. But if he is equally unable to refute the reasons on the opposite side, if he does not so much as know what they are, he has no ground for preferring either opinion. Now here's a very different view. The philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways. The point is to change it. And the author of this quote is none other than Karl Marx. No surprise. I am shocked, shocked. Well, not that shocked. Now, that can be very inspiring to an undergraduate, but is that really the point of intellectual life? Is that what professors should be focused on? And here's where the two visions begin to differentiate from one another. When I showed up at Yale in 1981, here's what it said over the doorway. It said, lux et veritas. So truth as the telos, the purpose, the goal of the university was very clear and explicit. But over, uh, over the time that I've been in the academic world, the telos at many schools has been gradually changing to more the, the, the Marxist one of change. The point of this place is to change the world, and not just change in general, but social justice in particular. I'm gonna argue that what we need is a schism. We must separate the universities into those that are pursuing uh, social justice, and Brown has volunteered to take the leadership position on that, um, <laughs> and those that are going to devote themselves to pursuing truth as their telos, and Chicago has, has volunteered to take the leadership position on that. That sounds like a pretty defining line indeed. Truth versus social justice. Sounds a little pious and confrontational, does it? Them's fighting words. <laughs> but here's Height's point. The university is built upon research so that we can come closer to a scientifically objective truth. And this, quote, truth is amenable once new evidence is discovered. Height states that changing a university's function from research to social justice comes too high of a cost. Key to the new morality 
is a method of looking at society and looking in terms of power and privilege. So the old idea of an education is come to campus, we're going to teach you lots of perspectives that you can use, you know, what would an, let's look at poverty. What would an economist say? You know, what, what would a Marxist say? What, you know, we used to learn a lot of perspectives to look at a single problem. What's happening now is some students, again, it's only in a few departments, right. but they're learning one perspective to look at everything. And so you start, this, so there's a good kind of identity politics, which is, you know, if black people are being denied rights, let's fight for their rights. That's the good kind. But there's a bad kind, which is to train students, to train young people to say, let's divide everybody up by their race and gender and other categories. We'll assign them moral merit based on their level of privilege is bad and victimhood is good. Okay, now let's look at everything through this lens. All social problems get reduced to this simple framework. I think we're doing them a disservice. I think we're actually making students less wise. Uh, this kind of viewpoint leads to the idea that the university is there to challenge privilege and power and um, um, viewpoint diversity, political diversity, would just get in the way. On this view of human nature, on this view of intellectual life, a university must have viewpoint diversity, and it dies. It dies if it has political orthodoxy and a monoculture. So, instead of research to discover the truth, which would include social justice movements, there's a narrowing of the mind of the student. Once a mind is narrowed, a fractured and distorted narrative is formed, and any kind of divergent opinion is seen as a threat to progress. Height states that a monoculture is dangerous. Danger! One of the most important principles in the psychology of reasoning is called motivated reasoning. So there's a general principle, uh, as William James put it, thinking is for doing. We don't just think to find the truth unless that's what we're done. And that thing is usually social. That is, we're always concerned to look good in the eyes of others. We're always concerned to help our team win and to make it clear that we're on our team's side and we're against the other side. And you can get in real trouble if people suspect that you're not loyal to your team. <clears throat> so our thinking is extremely motivated by self-interest, reputational concern, and partisan or tribal or other group identities. Of course, who am I to question academia? I'm not smart enough. Oh, it's under so crates. I don't know what's really going on. I have no idea what's going on. We can trust academics to be objective, right? Trust me, I'm a doctor. Unfortunately, you'd be wrong on that assumption as well. WRONG! Height goes on to cite David Perkins from Harvard, stating that people with high IQs, especially academics, are not immune to something called motivated reasoning. As people go up in IQ, they're better at reasoning, but only at finding reasons on their side. This is the general rule, motivated reasoning. And so if you put a bunch of people together that are all on the same team and you ask them to find the truth around something that matters to them, they cannot do it. They will be abysmal at it. So even if the smartest amongst us can fall under the spell of motivated reasoning, Trust in me. What hope do the rest of us have? Hype brings the original concept of the university back into the picture and coins the term institutional disconfirmation. Uh, and so this is the genius of a university and of a jury. Uh, in a university setting, in the academic setting, uh, the way I refer to it is uh, institutionalized disconfirmation. We all have the confirmation bias, which means we're using our, all of our IQ, we're using all of our thinking to confirm what we already believe or want to believe. It's almost impossible, so you, know, you think scientists are out there looking for the truth? Not as individuals, they're not. They came up with an idea, and they're so excited about their idea, and they want to publish their idea. They want it to be true. <laughs> Fortunately, a, a scientific community is structured so that one scientist puts something out there, and he knows he's going to be accountable, so he'd better be sure. So he's careful. So he puts it out there, and then 17 people critique it so that the truth can emerge from the interaction of these flawed individuals. Height goes on to say that when it comes to solving problems, individually, humans are quite stupid. No, 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 no. But if you put humans together in a certain way, something amazing happens. So once you see that as individuals, we're all really kind of stupid, but if you put us together in the right way, it's that we all are guaranteed institutional disconfirmation because of the institutional setting, and that could be a jury too which is that all of our confirmation biases cancel each other out. And the group is actually brilliant. 
And so it's sort of like our brains. Our brains are made of lots of neurons. Each neuron's really stupid. It just <laughs> fires or doesn't fire, fires or doesn't fire. That's all it does. But if you put the neurons together in the right way, patterns get matched and then something bigger comes out. He brings it all home in this clip here. That's what I want to emphasize over and over again, that a university is special because it is one of the only places where we have institutionalized disconfirmation. And if that breaks down, then that whole field of scholarship has broken down and is not reliable and cannot be trusted and cannot be used to give policy recommendations. In other words, if it hasn't been through institutionalized disconfirmation, you have no idea if it's true. You're going to believe it if you like it and your friends will validate that view, but you're probably wrong about a lot of the things you believe most fervently. And the only cure for that is viewpoint diversity. Because there's a disintegration in the arena of ideas in academia, many of academia's research findings are becoming more and more distrustful. They're pumping out ideas that have not been rigorously tested. And if you want to test those ideas yourself, you're likely going to be branded a racist, sexist, bigot, homophobe, transphobe, and or some kind of other phobe. And because of the ever increasing political and philosophical orthodoxy on university campuses, Haidt says that this movement of social justice marks the dawn of a new religion. Because what you have to see is, is, is there, it's a church, that's right. Wow. And you cannot have blasphemy on campus. And so the best way to understand what happened, I think, is an auto de fe. It's a, it's a, you know, a, a religious right coming together to punish the sinner, to punish the devil, and to reaffirm our community. This explains the exiles of Professor Heather Hying and Brett Weinstein. This explains the riots on college campuses. This explains the increased sensitivity of the American public on social media. And this is what makes Jonathan Haidt part of the intellectual dark web and why he's so dangerous against the regressive culture you see on campus. Danger! He's dangerous because he's seeking to renew the purpose of the university. This is dangerous because the university and academia at large is one of the pillars of American culture. American culture is made up of various institutions, but academia is one of the biggest institutions. It can easily bend culture one way or another. Academia, along with Hollywood, TV, music, fashion, and religious organizations, roughly make up the culture you engage in and promote. And guess how many of these institutions are progressively, or in this case, regressively dominated? Gee, let me think. So what's the cure? Height is slinging some serious mud here. What's his solution? Good question, viewer. His solution is opposition and heterodoxy. He says, prepare your child for the road, not the road for your child. He brings up the psychological principle known as anti-fragility. Like the immune system, you have to expose it to various bacteria and toxins in order for it to become robust and strong. On a more practical matter, Haidt himself explains how he's going to expose his son to some of the harshness of the world so his son won't have a metaphorical allergic reaction to it or worse, freak out on social media. What I'm going to do next week with my son, so I'm, I'm Jewish, uh, my, my wife is Korean, and um, uh, what I'm going to do with my son is we're going to go on some Nazi websites and I'm going to show him the ugliest, most horrible anti-Semitic stuff I can find. Um, because when my son sees the word, again, I would, I would say it if the camera wasn't on, but when my son sees certain racial slurs or anti-Semitic slurs, I don't want him to have an allergic reaction to that. I want him to have no reaction to it. Um, when I was a kid, I would see anti-Semitic slurs or, or swastikas in bathroom stalls. And what we did back then was nothing. It was just, it was just some idiot you know, wrote a swastika. Um, and what's happening today, I think, is that because we are preparing the road for the child, and we're keeping people, we're doing what we can, for good intentions, we are keeping kids as safe as we can keep them, so they don't get a chance to be exposed to the ugliness of life, and then when they inevitably encounter it, they have an immune, they have an allergic reaction. They are actually, I, you know, metaphorically, they're allergic to things that in past decades would have had really no reaction, or maybe just like a little like, eh. And all this ties to university and social justice. Universities are becoming churches of orthodox thought, and their creed is social justice. Instead of the pursuit of truth, it's a fight against the oppressor on behalf of the oppressed. In closing, the academic pursuit of truth will inevitably train some students to pursue social justice. However, these students will have been trained how to think, not 
what to believe in. They will begin to see the injustices of the world, not solely in terms of power and privilege, oppressed versus oppressor. They will have a multifaceted toolkit to tackle the ills of society. They'll be exposed to the nastiness of the world without rioting or shutting down people's speech. They'll be trained to spot real injustices when they see them versus blanket injustices everywhere. Height is dangerous to the orthodox thought of the universities, where much of the power is wielded by one political narrative. That about does it for Jonathan Haidt. There are links to his projects in the section below. Our next member of the intellectual dark web will be Camille Paglia. Here's a quick teaser of things to come. It, yes. Society inscribes gender on us. Yes, yes. It's absurd. Yes, it's one, one I'm, it, I, For heaven's sakes, I'm someone who wrote, was writing a dissertation on androgyny, okay? And, right. I, and I never for one moment in my entire life have questioned that the sexes are actually different and that there are, there is a very powerful hormonal compulsion that drives the sexes together for procreation. Hello? Okay. Until next time, this is the Board Observer. Thanks for watching.